I don't think I can surpass Frank's last talk. It was absolutely marvelous for those who were here. And I think Oregon Right to Life will be able to get copies of his talk for you. Uh, you can ask Gail or call the office. I always give a handout, and I made a hundred, so if you don't have a handout, I would suggest that you call Oregon Right to Life, ask for Jane, and she can mail a copy to you, because I made a, I made a hundred of them. Uh, I learned that a long time ago in medical school, and that's why my handwriting is terrible today. I could never keep up with the writing on the blackboard by the professors who would statistic, or uh, in a sadistic way say, you can't keep up with me. And so I think you can sit back, relax. The main things that I'm going to talk about are on these slides, but I gave you a book this year. It's 27 pages, and there's no way I can cover 27 pages in 45 to 47 minutes. So there's a lot more information in your handout because I list from November through this past month all the attacks of over 100 or so just these last four months on religious liberty and your conscience. It's everywhere. It's, uh, it's uh, exponentially increasing uh, each month. So please use your handout, and if you don't have one, you can contact Jane or Oregon Right to Life. I like to begin with a prayer, a prayer that's special for me and uh, to start this conference because it's really the program this year is the hope of the child. And the child, if you listen to the lead speaker this morning, uh, doesn't see much hope if you're inside the womb. So we like to say a prayer. Today we pray for all of God's children especially those who are aborted, abused, or abandoned. We pray for a society that, no long, that not, not only tolerates that violence, but promotes that violence. We pray for the men and women who they do not know they are doing that violence. And we particularly pray that God's mercy and grace and love transform those people to forgive themselves, their victims, and to say, I'm sorry to their creator, God Almighty. Amen. Amen. All right. I don't know how you felt after the November 7th. Was six was the election, but it took me a day to recover. But not only the Statue of Liberty was weeping, I thought it was an end to my life. And I've talked to a lot of people about my age, and they felt similarly, that something happened. A darkness was there that prevailed uh, that could not ever be obtained again. I, so I felt very dark. And if you look at that picture and that shadow to the right, I felt that something dark Satan, man, whomever you want, vampires, uh, there is a certain darkness over our country. Our country, I thought, depending on the result of that election, would either regain some of its religiosity, its objective values, or it would lose those values forever. We have a president who has decided on kingship or dictatorship rather than a democracy. And the attacks on the First Amendment, even though we've heard many, many attacks and, uh, on both sides for the Second Amendment, gun, gun control, our First Amendment, our ability to say what we believe in public without being called terrible names or threatened or criminalized or in jail, in prison uh, is under attack. We have not only the threat of the inside as marvelously presented to you this morning by our first speaker, Lila, uh, about abortion and the bravery of those four pro-life people standing in front of a, kneeling in front of a raucous crowd to say that we do believe in life. They remind me that picture of the early Christians in the Colosseum. 
waiting for the lions to come out. On the other side, uh, Robert Spencer is probably the foremost author on radical Islam. Uh, he has a website, uh, and I recommend it. You will be depressed if you do. Uh, he's written a new book about the effect of radical Islam. And if the Boston Marathon didn't raise our awareness that there are some Muslims out there that uh, think of only one thing, hate and revenge, or a moment of glory, uh, then you need to read his book. Frank mentioned, and I think Lila also mentioned, about what's going on in our schools. It's pathetic. It is absolutely pathetic. Now, I spent the last two years talking to you about communism and the takeover of communism or socialism uh, or radical secular humanism. They're all kind of connected in our schools. And that the primary problem we have in our school is what they're being indoctrinating into the ch minds of our children. Hooked is a lovely book uh, by a doctor, who, Dr. McElhaney, who has said, not only do you have to worry about venereal disease and unwanted pregnancy, uh, it has a permanent effect, just like drugs, on the brains of our children who are being hit with over-explicit age-inappropriate sex ed beginning in the kindergarten. It will have an effect on their brains, which will be permanent as they go through life. Good book to read. Uh, McElhaney, Dr. McElhaney. <laughs> All right, hold on for a sec. Uh, it's Joseph, and it's MC, capital I L. H-A-N-E-Y. He's a doctor of medicine. And the other book is, no one is, this, this whole program today is about the child. And as we look for gay marriage, as you look for all the attacks, single motherhood, uh, single parenthood, who is watching over the children? That is the thing. As we look at radical, sex, explicit sex ed, has any of these so-called elitist or socialist or thinkers thought about what effect is this having on our children that will be permanently affected. Sorry. We talk about and we abuse the word equality. Uh, Mr. Ted Olson, who was a conservative and tried to get uh, Bush past the hanging chads with the election in 2000 has now turned into saying that it's an equality issue. Gay marriage and same-sex attraction, it's an equality issue. And therefore, we have to think that everybody should have equal rights, no matter what orientation. A wonderful book by Anne Hendershot, I recommend it as The Poli Politics of Deviance. It's a good read. And if you want to be, and I, I guess the thing I would reiterate that Frank said is that we all need to be educated. We're dumbed down, even those who keep up. We all need to be educated by reading appropriate material. I call this slide the children of men, not God, because man now has said we don't need God. God has been kicked out of our schools. It has been minimized even in religious institutions, certainly in our society. Uh, we're catered, we're not catered to, we are patronized saying, well, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton and our president has both said, listen, we're not taking away your religious worship. You're free to worship any way you want. Just keep it inside the four walls of your church. Do not bring it to the public square. So this book is, you know, we've talked about demographic, demographic uh, winterization of Europe. Uh, it will be Muslimized within probably the next 20 years. Italy will be primarily, uh, the Vatican will be surrounded by Islamic State uh, because no one is reproducing. 50% of Italian women don't get married and 50% of Italian women don't have any babies. So the replacement rate is now 1.2. Uh, 
and it needs 2.2 or 2.1 to re just keep it even. Then we have, again, uh, these wonderful elitist scientists, social thinkers who say, why have children? The ethical debate. So what have we done to the concept of that beautiful picture of a newborn baby? Or the excitement of a mother and father when they see their first picture of their baby in an ultrasound? What have we done to that? And then we have uh, some more radical thinkers. Hannah Rosen has written an article in the Atlantic Magazine, and she said, the end of men. And she's basically saying to women in college who want to be CEOs and directors of multinational organizations, go out and have relations as much as you want, but do not get attached. Because if you get attached, then that's going to, that's going to be that big bump in your road that will frustrate you from becoming the woman that you were meant to be, which is controlling 500 million men uh, in your organization. Another uh, so-called socialist scientist from Britain said the new rules. What are the new rules? And she equates having sex outside marriage like having a pizza elsewhere. That most of us have dinner at home, but we do go out occasionally and eat at wherever. And why can't sex be the same way with no, certainly no guilt involved? And that will make everybody happy. These are teaching at Cambridge University and Hannah has written in Atlantic, as I said, and she is the new Betty Friedman, Freedom, who said in 1960, who started the feminine mystique for those old enough to remember, uh, women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And that was her cry. And women, take your apron off, get out of that darn kitchen, and be equal to your man. He's got to do the dishes from now on and everything else. So we have a defeminization of women and a demasculization of men. It gets worse. You look at the college campuses. What are our kids being taught? This man wrote a book about sex at Yale. Now, if you remember, again, going way back, William Buckley wrote a beautiful book on God, men, and Yale. And when he said, wrote that 50-some years ago, he was saying, what happened to the godlike principles that Yale was founded on? Where is God? Well, God's gone. And now sex has is, sex is replaced him. So now it's no longer God and men at Yale. It's sex. And he goes through, and this is, a very, this is for the strong stomach people among you. If you are timid, do not read this book. It'll show you the indoctrination of freshmen. Uh, Lila mentioned a little bit to it, starting out with not only free contraception, uh, but they have one week there where everything goes at Yale. Same thing happening in Delaware and Columbia. Columbia and Yale are trying to vie for number one on perversion. And that's a course that uh, they don't sell papers to, but it is there ever bit. And then we had, last year, we had that wonderful speaker talking about that one blind, brave Chinese man who was fighting by himself against the Chinese government of one-child policy. But the one thing that we forget is that, you know, sex trafficking is a huge sequelae, a sequel of what happens when we have sex, sexual human trafficking. The Obama said to, uh, recently to the U.S. Catholic Bishops Association last year, uh, we can't fund you anymore. You're, you're giving money to help these poor women and men who are being taken. They're usually out from poor countries, but also right here in the United States. And they're having money used and grant money uh, to take care of these women. But because the Catholic Church does not believe in abortion or Oh my God, contraception, those funds were eliminated by the Obama administration this year. Two trials going on. One happened in 1946, and uh, Dr. Carl Brandt, who was Hitler's personal physician and the head of his T4 program. I always like government words. They always use words that are so oblique that you're saying, what? Doesn't sound too bad, T4. And it's an address in, uh, in, in Berlin. And from there, they murdered 275 Germans who were not up to snuff. 
they were mongoloid, Down syndrome, defected, World War I vets who were wounded. And so they started that out even before World War II. And Dr. Carl Brandt uh, was the mastermind of that. He was hung two years later after his trial in Nuremberg in 1948. I would hope we would have enough courage to hang this man who has done as much harm, maybe not 275,000, but he has murdered women, he has murdered infants, and for CB, ABC, CBS, uh, CNN, and all the major ones, this trial has gone on for five weeks, and only this past week, because of people using social media, has embarrassed them to cover the atrocities of what's going on. And who turned him in? His co-workers. And if you read the testimony, as Anderson Cooper did, he, I think he said, my God, this is what? <laughs> I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-reproductive rights, but this, this sounds really bad. Screams being heard and bloody babies and the snapping of necks after birth of live infants. The filth and his own colleagues that he trained, a, a non-high school, non school graduate to do his anesthesia. And they wonder why the lady died from overdose of anesthesia. So, two days before last year's election, the nuncio, the sp spokesman from the Vatican, came and talked at Notre Dame and said, the persecutions of Christians is a reality, even in America. And if you don't believe it, it's time to wake up. I've been saying this now for five years. It can present itself in many forms, but the first one is, we don't want you at the party. <laughs> Do your worship, keep your religion personalized, but don't dare to speak your views at the uh, public square or on social media, because you will be persecuted. We hear a lot about tolerance and equality, and these are words that have been flip-flopped, just like uh, 1984, uh, Aldous Huxley. Words mean things, and all social engineering uh, begins before the actual, or all social engineering begins uh, with verbal engineering. We don't know what words mean anymore. And so the traditional view of tolerance was to be egalitarian or equal to someone who has a different view. You're going to still respect them. He may say black is greater than white, and you say white is greater than black. But you respect each other. You can have a dialogue. That's the second commandment, right? Love thy neighbor. You may think his ideas are wacko, but that doesn't mean you think he's wacko and you treat him with respect. That was the traditional definition of tolerance. Tolerance applied to how we treat people with dignity, no matter if we have different color of skin or different religious belief or different ideas. But ideas, we treat. We don't say your false ideas, in my opinion, are equal. They are not. That's illogical. Unfortunately, we have flipped this around, and the gay media and the gay activists have particularly used this, Muslim, radical Muslim, pro-abortion, all these tentacles of evil coming in have used it by flipping it, saying all ideas are equal. But it's you bigots that say, you know, that the Bible is hate speech. So they flipped it completely around. And so if you reject my ideas, no matter what it is, you re disrespect me just by saying, I love you. I'm worried about your eternal soul. I want to make sure your soul gets to heaven. If you're a Christian and your activity that you're doing right now may not make it, you know, make it possible for you. So I, out of love as a Christian, I say, Think about what you're doing. No, no, you can't do that because you hate me, you disrespect me, you're a bigot, and you need to be intolerant, and you need to be silenced. Anthony Esselon is a great writer. He's got a great book out right now. It's a great read. But Aristotle, a long time ago, he was quoted this morning in the first session, said, define justice as giving each his due. Okay, each is due. His definition, however, admits 
of equality and inequality. And he uses as his metaphor this big 300 pound Sumi wrestler against a child. Right? David and Goliath. They're not equal <laughs> in strength, size, or whatever. And so by definition, we give that infant or the unborn child his due, the protection that is due, the unalienable right that it's due. But we may say that we give another protection to that sumo wrestler who's having trouble with his diabetes. It, you, you, cannot, you cannot compare. Each person is equally deserving of his due. This is the Christian message. But enforcing equality, you must have it. We must have. And now, not only with gay marriage, we have now polyamory. Hillary Clinton has said that she's for the big three now as she begins her run in four years. I'm for adultery, I'm for polygamy, and I'm for polyamory. That means more than two. Okay? And then you've got a group of Germans, only in Germany, <laughs> uh, zoophilic bestiality, who are complaining, say, we don't harm animals, we love animals, and why can't we love them completely? Once you change a definition, once you change the words, then it all comes tumbling down. Humpty Dumpty said that many years ago, and for that, you can't see in the back. When I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone to Alice, it means just what I choose it to mean. Neither more nor less. But Alice asks whether you can make words mean so many different things, and he says the question is, which is to be master, that's all. He who masters words, as we saw that from Frank is what Hitler said, you can put right there on Obama's script right now. Persons are different. The words and the message are the same. And the evil is the same. So, bigotry and the abuse of language. People who oppose gay marriage are being treated like homophobes. Bigots. Intolerant by those who call for tolerance. Think of that. I mean, they're screaming, and it's, you know, then you have to think of the letter to Timothy, about St. Paul's letter. You know, we can't see the two by four in our eye, but we can see the splinter in somebody else of the same defect. So those who are yelling for tolerance and equality and understanding and compassion are the least intolerant, compassionate, people on earth at this point. Bigot is now used not to convey a meaning, but as a kind of a verbal slap in your face. It stops conversation and discussion in a rational manner. Bad rhetoric makes bad men, Ralph Emerson said, and every idle word, Matthew said in his gospel, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give it account on the day of judgment. And I really, rec really love this man. He was a former president of, uh, uh, secretary general of the United Nations. He died in a plane crash. To misuse words is to show contempt for men. We're no longer civil anymore. Look at the pickup truck that never stops at the side stop sign and comes right in. We're flipping each other off on small things, just driving etiquette. The, you know, the F word has become dialogue and debates on TV and in the home and in the school. So to misuse those words is to show contempt for man and it causes man to regress down the long path of evolution. So the five stages, can you just give me, when I have five minutes left, a high sign? Because I tend to, could be here three hours. <laughs> The five stages of persecution. Now, the first three have been around since Cain and Abel. <laughs> Stereotyping, vilifying, and marginalizing. It's only the last five to six years that if you are a bigot, quotes, by a group called a bigot, you can be criminalized. You can be imprisoned. You can be fined. You can be not only a beating behind the woodshed, you can be physically persecuted, which is the last stage. 
And right now, there was a wonderful article in January by a Monsignor who said, we are now between the fourth and the fifth stages. We're now going between criminalization now to physical persecution. So as I mentioned, the first three have been around, but they've certainly increased since the 60s. And most of them are ad hominem. Now you'll hear a lot of people on TV use ad hominem arguments. Uh, Bob Beckel is classic. And O'Reilly uh, at times drives me nuts because he said last night that the father of these two assassins was a loon. How does he know that? That's, a, that's an ad hominem argument. He's calling name calling. So Christians have been called for Cain and Abel, Bible thumpers, hater, haters of science, hypocrites, archaic, bigots, imposing. We're imposing our morality. Uh, Self-righteous, hate-filled, narrow-minded, and you could write a whole book on all that. Once again, uh, the nuncio from the Vatican, martyrdom doesn't necessarily mean physical torture and death. However, the objective are those who desire to harm the faith may choose a path of making you so feeling ridiculous that they silence you. And that is a wonderful, powerful tool to silence you and have felt marginalized. Where are we today? Just some examples, very brief. And I've got six pages on those 27 pages. I can't go through them all, so I'm going to give you some highlights. HHS mandate starting in August of this year. So far, it's hit and miss on the judges. The judges says you haven't been hurt enough, so therefore we're going to say that you don't have a stand. But it's coming, and you will be fined or imprisoned, and we'll find out come August. Catholic adoption agencies, because they were uh, discredited, because they did not refer to homosexual couples, have been, essentially been shut down. The last adoption agency in the UK was shut down this past year. And you know how many years they've been doing this in the Catholic Church in this country? Outstanding service for finding homes for children and having wonderful, well-kept, well-cleaned, well-educated orphanages. Free speech, I'll talk to you a little bit more about it, but in March, of just the north of us in Canada, free speech now has been attacked in a landmark case. And this man, I don't know what his credi credibility is, he's a representative from California, but he said this, Reparative therapy. If you have a confused teenager, male or female, who says, I, I don't know, I've got, am, I, am I a homosexual? Am I a lesbian? I really don't know. I, I'm teased about it. I'm not very well liked. I'm confused. I need help. He cannot get help anymore in California. It is now a crime for a psychiatrist, psychologist, a counselor to tell this confused kid in class, you know, why don't we just sit down and talk about it there is a thing called reparative therapy. It's not 100%. It started by, uh, in part by the priest, I forgot his name, who started uh, Courage. Uh, and it's been done in Holland by the best book on homosexual reparative uh, therapy is by a Dutch psychologist who's been doing this for 30 years. And he has about a 25, 30% chance of success if they have a strong faith. If they want to change, they can change. And yes, there has been suicides. And this is why this representative said one or two teenagers got so confused, the help didn't help, it made it worse, and they killed themselves. Therefore, a politician now changes an aspect of medicine that was helping these confusions. And why are they confused? Because the explicit sex ed programs starting in the sixth grade that everything goes including your pet dog. In Brazil, they have so much AIDS along the homosexual population, they're dying off like flies. They decided this United Nations agency, and I've talked about the United Nations before, they are primarily not themselves evil, but there are a lot, a lot of evil going on at the United Nations by people with an agenda. And so they want to criminalize homophobia, whatever that means. 
because of the high incidence of AIDS in gay men that they're getting persecuted. So they want to see criminalize the next step. Activists in the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, down south has now officially said to the Obama White House, we want to recognize the Catholic Church as a hate group. That's, okay. In Italy, 200 homosexual activists surrounded this archbishop's house at his home. That's the same thing, archbishop's house at his home. <laughs> and chanted slurs and everything else, threatened verbally that we want to attack you. Why? This is this uh, person here is a bigot, and he's not to be trusted because he wears a white collar. Here's what he said. This is what upset him. The purpose of homosexual right activist is to undermine what is the cornerstone of civilization, a marriage between man and woman, and the concept of family founded on marriage, equating to other forms of cohabitation. He realizes that anyone who has the guts to even mention this now, the First Amendment, to mention this will be persecuted either at home, physically, or this happened. This is the first evidence of physical violence in the United States. It happened last year at the Family Research Center, where uh, this activist, LBGT, was working, and he said, I'm going to go down to those no-good bigots down there at Family Research Center, and I'm going to bring a revolver. I'm going to kill them. And he was stopped by an unarmed guard, thank God, who was shot in his arm, doing fine. <clears throat> but this is, to my knowledge, the first physical evidence of, of uh, the stages of persecution. Now, I live in Redmond, but just a month ago, we had three churches burned down in Bend. That's been going on for a long time. I call that criminalization or personal f persecution. Now, if you want to say, you know, I'm tired of the United States and all of its problems, I'm going to move to Iran, I don't recommend that trip. <laughs> because this wonderful present Ayatollah says the promotion of Christianity must be stopped. Do you realize that there's an article out that since the year 2000, six million Iranians have converted to Christianity? How? TV and Bibles. The little Bible groups are starting. Now they know if they're caught, they're going to be there in that hang position. Now those are prisoners, but you know Iran doesn't uh, have a long uh, ACLU trials that go on for years and years. They, 500 executions in four months in one prison. Then I came across this wonderful man. He was born a Romanian Jew and became an Anglican priest. And these people, voices of martyrs, you want to join up? Any volunteers? They go into countries that are being, Christianity is being persecuted. There's 71 countries in this globe right now that are being, Christianity is not wanted. That's where they go. That's where they go. They're like the early Christians in the Colosseum to me. And he mentioned this one brave woman story. Torturers are men that never go to church, never read the good book, holy book, or frequent the homes of believers. Their only chance of making it to heaven, to be saved, to have a Christian prisoner before them, to speak to them about Christ with love, even when being tortured. And I would say whether you're Catholic, Anglican, Jewish, Meta Pentecostal, what have you, we've lost that. We've lost that. We've never been persecuted physically. And we need to regain that if we're going to win this fight. I mentioned that landmark case. Here's a man putting out flyers on a corner in Canada saying, here are the medical risks. If your son or daughter are gay, these are the medical risks. They're going to lose 20 years off their life. The average gay man takes 20 years off his life by that diagnosis if he stays to be an active gay. 
The Canadian Supreme Court just a month ago said, uh -huh. <laughs> stop, you're fine. If you do it again, we'll imprison you because truthful statements can be presented in a manner that would meet the standard of hate speech. Now say that again. Truthful statements can meet a criteria that can be considered hate speech. So what the Catholic Church and Christian churches have said, love the sinner, hate the sin. They're saying no more. No more. That is not equal. Now it's those two are equal in the eyes of the Supreme Court. Therefore, you are not welcome in the public square to tell the truth. Now, this will come down as a landmark case unless it is reversed. Now, Obama won the woman's vote, the name and only Catholic vote. Uh, for those, I mean those that go to church on a, uh, rarely. The Latino vote, the youth vote, the low information vote, but it got 68% of the pornographers. And in April, before the election, he told Eric Holder, listen, let's lay low on uh, persecuting of internet porn. We'll give it to a lesser, uh, don't have the department of, uh, your department uh, do it, we, uh, the local levels can do it better. Really? Larry Flint mocked that Sarah Palin was a disservice to every woman in the United States because she dared to have a child who was born with Down syndrome. This is the people he got. There is it. Did you know that Eric Holder's wife is an OBGYN? Did you know that she has a part ownership of an abortion clinic? So does that make sense why Eric Holder, who did he prosecute, persecute and prosecute primarily was people standing up with their little sign saying life is precious? Did you know that? I'm telling you. Now, this is my thought. My wife and I teach religious education for entry into the Catholic Church for the last five years. And I'm saying, are we looking at this whole discussion of abortion and euthanasia and all these and embryonics from the wrong way? And I think we are. That's my personal opinion. They're symptoms of a greater disease. And the greater disease is ignorance of faith. You can say ignorance of truth. Ignorance of faith. It can become a spiritual malignancy that affects our heart, our ability to love, our ability to think or reason our mind, and our conscience judging moral acts. We become more clueless, a dumbing down of our faith. Faith is a gift from God, but along with being a gift, we have to respond to it. James said that a long time ago. And it's our responsibility to choose what? What does our faith tell us? Everyone in this room, to know, love, and serve God so we can be with Him forever in total love for an eternity. For an eternity. Do we believe that? Or is it a Santa Claus story? And how do we defend our faith? With one hour a week out of 168 hours? Is that how we know our faith? So I think in my lifetime, I've seen, myself included, been dumbed down until you have to say, I need to be smarted up. Pius X, St. Pius X died in 1914. And he said this way back when, a hundred years ago. All the evil in the world is due to lukewarm Catholics. You could say Christians. Lukewarmness is a disease. Our Lord said in the gospel, I will spit you out. So I think the number one problem, as I look at it, my personal belief is that we as Christians who do have a belief and we have all these social ills and things going on in our life, uh, that we have become lukewarm. If we were red hot, he never would have gotten a second term. Swedish education now, this is all post-election. Say, and I'm Swedish, so I can knock the Swedes. Uh, 
Children may be taken to church for Advent. Last Advent? Nice. Swedes. 1% of people go to church in Sweden on a regular basis. But you can go to Advent, but you can't mention the name of Jesus. <laughs> Gospel of Asia, 400% increase in assaults and Christians in India alone. 71 nations persecute Christians. And then Canadian hate crime law. I love this. Anybody who says gender identity or sexual orientation, GI or SO, these are now considered groups to be protected by anti-hate UN groups and our president administration. So basically you can get a snotty-nosed, little lying, deceptive teenage boy that says, you know what, it's Tuesday, I feel feminine today, I want to go in the girls' potty room. He doesn't need a note from a psychiatrist or a counselor. He can choose to be a male on Tuesday and Thursday, be a female on Wednesday or Friday. Not only is in Canada, Massachusetts, our land of the free, passed this in March. We call it the bathroom potty law. With no documentation, because now gender doesn't mean how you are made physically, it's how you feel about it. Then the EU, European Union, proposal to ban children's books depicting traditional gender. Oh, you cannot show a woman washing the dishes or the man mowing the lawn. No gender, isosex. And then the scientists now, this past 200 years, we've sterilized those we didn't want to reproduce or kill them in the womb or out of the womb. Now we're going to do gene or genetic enhancement. And if you don't have the bucks, you're just going to be a drone. You're not going to be on that spaceship to superb existence of, of increasing your, your, your intellect or your beauty. And then we had, just two weeks ago, the poor Alabama elementary. I, I have to say poor because her brain is not in her brain where it should be. She said that uh, they had Easter egg hunts, but you can't use the word Easter. It may offend. And her superintendent, I love him, within 24 hours said, uh, Principal, we don't mess with Christmas or Easter. And so we're going to call it Easter Egg Hunt. But this is how far our educational system, if we allow this and we sit back and if we are non-knowledgeable of the junk that's going on, they're, they're mowing us down. They are mowing us down. Han is in, Han, and Han is out. That's Swedish words for boy and girl. But Han is whatever. Fifth grade, they're indoctrinating these kids in the Swedish school, Egalia. They don't mention sex at all, or differences. Everyone is now unisex, or not sexy, neutral. Neutral. So the little dolls, you don't see a boy doll or a girl doll, they're neutral dolls. Designed to make sure that children don't fall into those gender stereotypes. <laughs> Unisex, but why? What is their purpose? I'll leave that up for you to deduce. Diversity Day at, uh, in Maine, women or children, this was mid-school, showed graphic homosexual foreplay to demonstrate tolerance. And the irate parents had to calm the waters at home and clean up the vomit. Their kids have seen this at the ages of 11 and 12. All for tolerance. UK schools now at 13, you can have an IUD put in, contraception, parents, no, no consent. The Brits have gone nuts. They're the most amoral country in Europe, in my opinion. The most amoral. And they're saying, well, why does the pregnancy rate keep going up? And they just keep giving it to, you know, preteens now. But what are we doing wrong? And then in Michigan, they showed the mirror, Planned Parenthood. I love them. They can take what's right and make it left, up, down, black, white. The miracle of abortion film is being shown. The miracle of abortion. To show boys and girls what a woman's body goes through when she undergoes an abortion. Sick? Yeah. All right. 
I've got five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna, this basically, uh, this indoctrination of parents' rights, uh, they're getting less in age by bringing up stuff that is inappropriate for the children. Basically inappropriate. I don't think any 11-year-old needs to know about oral or anal intercourse or the 125 positions of sexual relations. I think that's overkill. Maybe I'm a bigot. But. Now, I want to just mention these two, two families, because one case, this, this is a tragedy. Again, in Sweden, Swedish man is married to an East Indian girl. They have a child, and they were homeschooling. They, had, they did three sins. They homeschooled. He had a few caries in his mouth, a few dental caries. And he missed about one or two vaccinations. So they're on a plane to go to India, and he's pulled off, literally, pulled off the plane, separated from his parents for two years. Their crimes I just mentioned. Look at his face on the left in the yellow T-shirt. That's when he was happy. Look at his face now. Picture's worth a thousand words. About a year ago, this has been going on for three years, about a year ago he was reunited with his family, but a, a, a higher court overturned a lower court just two months ago. And now he's been removed permanently from his family. The mother collapsed. She collapsed at the hearing. So this is a Swedish gulag. This is family education, which will come here unless we stop it. Now, this family is going to be deported by Eric Holder and the Obama administration on the 23rd of this month. They've been here for three years. Their crime, homeschooling, Germany, Hitler, Nuts, no homeschooling. We want no other thoughts other than what we teach you in school. So it's outlawed, but no one did anything about it until they got some wacko in the head of education in Germany who said, we've got to start prosecuting these people. Now that is a beautiful, all-American, all-German family. Six children. They've been living in Tennessee with political asylum for the last two or three years. Eric Holder has said that homeschooling is not a human right. And because not all homeschoolers believe, or all Christians believe that you, they should homeschool only, therefore they are using the rules of the European Union and not our Constitution to decide that they have no right to have an asylum. It's being decided on Tuesday of this coming week by the Sixth Circuit Court. You can read about, and I don't have time, I'm going to end up because I'll be over, right? I've got uh, what's going on with sex ed and what it does to the mind. Again, please read those slides. Uh, this a doctor saying who studied AIDS and HIV for 25 years, uh, he said if you give Depo-Provera, which is the injectable birth control, you double the rate and transmission of AIDS in the sub-Saharan Africa. And we got two billionaires saying we got to contracept the world. Please read this about Mark Generis, a wonderful sociologist at Austin, Texas, who came out with a definitive study last year saying that there is a difference between being raised by a man and a woman and two lesbians or two homosexuals. He was vilified, threatened, death threats, threatened with being fired. They said his research stunk, and he had to have an independent uh, professional uh, organization come and review his literature, and they said it's right on. And yet, this is what happens when you have the courage to speak the truth, and you do objective science studies. This is what you expect. So I'm going to end up with these next four slides. We look at baby Chloe found in a garbage can with the umbilical cord attached this past month in Texas. And she was the most popular baby in Texas. 
So in all of us, there is a goodness. It's God-given. It's the natural law. Lila said it's in our, embedded in our hearts. That's natural law. That's a gift from God. So when we look at that, we're saying, my God, she was tossed in a garbage can? And I think they had something like over a 1,000 calls within 24 hours saying, we'll take her. We'll love her. We'll adopt her. So that is a hope. We have one mother in East India who says, I have too many children, so I have to strangle my daughter at birth because she happens to be a girl. We have that 88-year-old saint over there who's now dying of renal failure, who in her 80s adopted 30 babies in the trash cans in China with her one child. Her last adopted baby, she was 82. We have a difference. We all have a choice in this room, what we want to do. He wasn't Pope yet. That's a cardinal hat, but here he is washing the feet of a young boy in a wheelchair who is dying of AIDS. We all have that ability to love. We were created by love, for love, to love. And this beautiful picture painted by a wonderful Italian, I'm going to leave, this is the last slide. Gail always says, I have to give you hope after all that, because <laughs> Howie's going for a double right now. <laughs> this is a quiz, post-election quiz, November 2012. Not written by me, but somebody much smarter. It's true or false, 10 questions. It's in your notes. You don't have to copy them. As we look at this picture of Christ being mocked, and look at the gentleness of his hand still reaching out to the mocker and the gnarled hatred in the hand of the person who's mocking. We have 10 questions. True or false? Whoever won in November, Jesus will still be king. Whoever won. Our responsibilities as Christians will not have changed. Whoever won the greatest agent for social change to change the hearts and minds and men and women will be the gospel of life. Whoever won our primary citizenship will be in this order, the kingdom of God first and America, not vice versa. Whoever won the tomb will still be empty. Whoever won the cross, not the government, will be our salvation. Whoever won our children will be more concerned with whether we spend time with them rather than who is president. Whoever won my neighbor will still be my neighbor and loving him or her will still be the second greatest commandment. Whoever won Jesus is Lord who will be the greatest truth in the world. And last, whoever won, we will know and believe that God is in control. Yeah. Thank you.